Fair team, and uh, we've got a great turnout this morning, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, before we get started, I just want to show of hands, how many people have been to the fair before? For most of you guys. All right, so you know the drill. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Janet with Santa View Farms for hosting us today on this beautiful place, and uh, especially uh, thanks to Tough Built Tractors. They're our sponsors for this morning. And uh, we are going to get started right now. We're going to divide you guys into three groups. The one group will stay here, and Janet's going to give a talk and uh, tell us about the crops that she grows here on the farm. Uh, the next group is going to do a farm tour, and then the third group is going to go up, and we've got a tough-built tractor uh, that you guys can learn about, play on, drive, and... Uh, <laughs> And have some field work, so get some real, real world experience. So I'm going to turn it over to Janet, and she can tell you about the layout of, of the farm. And we'll get to okay, thank you, Allison. We're so excited to do this again. We did a field day last year for Mother Earth News, and we had so much fun. And when they asked if they could come again, we're honored to be involved with the Mother Earth News Fair. This is like the most exciting weekend <laughs> of the whole year for us. And so, welcome to our farm. I am Janet McKee, the founder and owner of the farm, and we are a historic landmark property. We were designated by the Pittsburgh Historic Landmark Foundation because all the buildings were built in the 1800s, and they wanted to make sure that as we renovated and updated that we preserved the historic significance, and they also wanted to make sure that the open farmland was preserved because we're in the middle of a tourist area. We wanted to make sure that they didn't that somebody didn't come along and build high-rise apartments. So I'm honored to have you at our 52-acre farm, but we're very small in produce production. We just farm a few acres. But we're going to tell you in my workshop about how we do it to extend the growing season and do a lot of intensive growing in a very small amount of land. Uh, we do have Shane that is brand new with us. Uh, Kevin's been our farm manager for years, and he's been a little bit under the weather, he is around, but Shane is brand new as of this week, but she's going to walk around and show you um, the various buildings and so forth, and all of what we do in those is going to be part of my talk. Okay. So we do have, here at the barn, I'm going to talk more during my talk, we do have restrooms right behind the cabinet here, so make yourselves comfortable, and how do we want to get separated into three groups? Okay, and first and I, I do want you to let, Tough Belt has goodie bags for everybody, they're in here, you're welcome to grab them now, or about Tough Belt, so feel free to grab it now or at the end, either way. Um, I think we're kind of... <laughs> Why don't we separate, like this is a group on this side, the back is a group, and the yeah. side's a group. How's yeah. that sound? That sounds great. So this group, let's stay with you, Excellent. and then the back group can start up the field with the Tough Belt folks, and then we'll get to the farm tour with you guys, and we'll just rotate. So once you finish with the farm tour, you'll go up to the tractors and then come back here, so everybody gets to do everything. She walks away with her purse. Yeah, isn't that? Oh, I'm sorry, pardon me. Hello, live audience. As you see, we're live with Mother Earth News at Sonic Farms. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, uh, bear with us because I'm just about to give a talk to the first group to explain what we do here at the farm to extend the growing season. So this is part of a talk I'm giving officially at the Mother of News Fair, but it's really fun to be on site. So we're just getting ready as we divide into groups, and we're getting to begin into the details of the discussion I want to have for you today. Okay. Somebody needs to come to make sure Reverend Stanley is in the camera. Oh, just look in the camera. You know more about that camera stuff than me. Oh. What do you want me to do? Just make sure it's, so yep. they can see me and hopefully they can hear. I can't be too far. Am I okay here? Yep. Okay. Perfect view. I can't be too far so they can hear. Okay. 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 This is probably the 
a significant part of the morning in terms of understanding what we do at the farm here, at Sana View Farms. And thank you all for coming here. Where's everyone from, basically? Local or far? Yeah. Irwin. You seem familiar. No, no, no. Where from? Irwin. Although maybe we saw you last year at the fair. Um, where do you come from? Maryland. Maryland. Anybody else out of state? Awesome. Welcome, welcome. You're in for just an amazing weekend, right? The fair. It's like so much fun. It's so awesome to be in a group with thousands of like-minded people. Tons of thousands. So it's just thrilling. I don't usually get this dressed up to be at the farm, but I'm speaking at the fair this afternoon and tomorrow and Sunday. So and also hosting a booth. So that's why I'm um, overdressed for farming today. <laughs> So anyway, thank you so much for coming. <coughs> I run an organization called Sauna View. Sauna is Latin for health and wellness. Yeah. And so I provide a view into how to live a healthier and happier life. And it's all based on getting back to the rhythms of Mother Nature. Right? When we go to bed once it gets dark out, and we wake in the morning, we drink fresh water, and we eat real food, which is the whole basis of all of this. And get outside and move our bodies, and again, breathe fresh air. That is the secret to living a healthy and happy life. I mean, everything we do for our physical well-being also affects our emotional well-being. And so think about the opposite, which is most of the people in society, where they stay up late watching the late news. If you want to be happier, stop watching the news. <laughs> right? They go to bed exhausted. Their alarm jolts them out of bed. They start their day with a cup of coffee and a Danish. Is that in the rhythms of Mother Nature? No, not at all. So it's so simple to be in fabulous health. It is so simple to feel fabulous emotionally. It is so simple to have high energy and be excited for life every day. And that is what I'm passionate about teaching people because it's basic common sense, and we like to follow what Mother Nature is teaching us. And so in that, I have all kinds of workshops and articles and recipes on our website at saunaview.com, but we had this inspiration, I did, that wouldn't it be cool to start an organic farm as part of that, right? Because I want to teach people about eating real food that's grown naturally. Like, how simple is that, right? <laughs> you know, I had someone say once that what today we call organic, our grandparents call food. Okay? But no, people aren't eating food anymore. They're eating box stuff loaded with chemicals and all kinds of crap. And it's no wonder everybody feels miserable. And it's no wonder we have so many diseases in this country, right? So Sauna View, Amen. Latin for Health and Moms, we give a view into how to live a better life. And this is our farm, Sauna View Farms. We are, as I mentioned, a 52-acre historic landmark farm. Because all the buildings are built in the 1800s, we want to preserve the open farmland. So I'm honored to own a historic landmark property. And um, we are very small in terms of number of people that work here. The staff is very limited. I tried one year to expand to do more gardening than just a few acres. And I lost so much money doing it because I was paying so much money on labor. Because growing organically. Does anybody here actually grow? Home growing? Or anybody grow commercial? No, that was just blind to one. <laughs> so it's going to be on an auction. You just buy like a million dollars. Okay, no. <laughs> so um, the growing organically, especially at any quantity, is extremely difficult, right? We can't just spray chemicals on the pests and the weeds. I have people down there with their hands and knees trying to deal with it. And we do try to study good farming practices. We're trying to trying to incorporate and learn how to do no-till, and we can talk about that in another conversation. We're trying, you know, to figure out how to improve the quality of the soil, because if the soil is high quality, then the plants are high quality, and they can then fight off pests and disease better, and you have less weeds and all of that. But it is an ongoing challenge. And I've owned the property since the end of 2012, or really our first year of production was 2014. And so far, it's costing us more to grow the organic produce than we're making selling it. And you can't be in business too long that way. So luckily, a few years ago, this very wonderful couple heard me being interviewed on the radio about health and wellness talking about my farm. And they said, hey, Jenna, we really love what you had to say. And your farm looks beautiful. We'd like to get married there. And we're like, OK, that's interesting. We never thought to do that before. 
And it was successful, and little by little, word of mouth, and now we're advertising. The weddings, even though we're a very low-cost venue, we don't charge much, are now paying for the produce for them. And everyone says, well, why do you keep growing produce if you're losing money? And it's like, because I feel there's nothing more important I could be doing in the world than growing food organically. And it's just, it's a principle I have. And so thank goodness, right? And this might be a seat where it's getting set up for a wedding this weekend, that we have other sources of income to help support the produce program. Okay, so anyway, in our excitement of growing organic <coughs> produce, we thought, wouldn't it be great to extend the growing season and to have fresh things to eat all year round if possible? But we're in the mountains of Pennsylvania. We are in the Laurel Mountains. And people have said, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. We get like a lot of snow and it gets very cold here in the wintertime. That's why Seven Springs is a ski resort, right? And so we thought, well, we're going to try anyway. And I'm going to tell you first about the things we did wrong <laughs> and the mistakes that we made because I don't want you to make the same mistakes. The first year, right, as the season's ending, we still had things in the field. The front field over here was our first garden in front of this greenhouse. And Shane is going to take you around and show you everything. So first year, we saw kale, we saw some mizuna that looked beautiful in the field. But the cold weather was coming. We thought, okay, we'll just trick Mother Nature and we'll put cold frames. But really, it was plastic, little plastic hoops, mm -hmm. like hoops with mm -hmm. metal hoops with plastic cover to try to extend our growing season. Yeah. And this may work in your yard. <laughs> it did not, not work here. here. We get a lot of wind coming off the mountain. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we get such strong wind coming off the mountain that the first year we built this greenhouse, it got ripped down in the wind. Wow. It got built stronger the second time. <laughs> okay. So we get wind. So number one, these plastic coverings, we were out there literally almost every day, in the rain, in the snow, <laughs> fighting with the wind to try to keep the plastic on these darn hoops to try to protect our produce, okay? We tried everything. We tried dr putting these clips on the plastic hoops. We tried drilling them on. We tried putting rocks and beams of wood to hold the plastic <laughs> down. I heard bags of sand work, but I'm sorry. We tried everything <laughs> that would be similar. And so you're out there in the wind and the rain and the snow. And then if you try to harvest, right, you're under this plastic and everything's wet and you're climbing under there, trying to, it was a nightmare. It did not work. Okay. So cold frames did not work here. Now maybe if we build hard boxes and you lift up, but that's also, I mean, where are you going to put that? We don't want to put that in our field that we drove over here. We want to find our track rover. Okay. So that did not work. So the next brilliant idea was, okay, we have a greenhouse. Let's heat it. That makes sense, right? Would everybody agree? Yeah. Heat the greenhouse. Of course, that's how you extend the season. Mm -hmm. Wrong. <laughs> okay. What we did was, and I'm sure there are better solutions than this, but I just got to tell you. We put a wood burning stove in the greenhouse, which you'll still see it sitting in there. And Kevin ran um, plastic tubing. Oh, he put a tub, uh, metal thing of water on top of the wood-burning stove to heat the water, and he ran tubing through the greenhouse because it's warm water, right? Not only did we have heat from the wood-burning stove, this warm water was going to help keep the greenhouse a nice temperature. Well, what do you think you have to do to a wood-burning stove all night long, all winter long, but feed it wood? Okay, so every few hours, Kevin would get up, Come and heat coolers right across the road. Come, feed the wood burning stove some wood, right, all night long, all winter long. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was we ended up with, I'm sorry, you got a bee. <laughs> we actually rescued honeybees behind the uh, thing. They usually don't come this far forward, but I think the, now the wedding started attracting them. There's something about you they like. Yeah. Must be your cologne. <laughs> so sweet. They'll leave you alone. <laughs> So what did we end up with? We ended up with a warm building, a warm, moist building with food in it. That's Kevin. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> okay. He's actually the great-great-grandson of the man that farmed this land back in the 1800s, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's his great-great-grandfather that cut these beans by hand and cleared this land by hand and built this barn by hand. Wow. Pretty cool. 
very cool. So, thank you so much. Yep. Okay. You're a lifesaver today. No. So, what do you think gets attracted to a warm, moist building with food in the middle of the winter? So we didn't even think we would have pests in the middle of winter, right? You think, okay, that's not going to be a problem. It's winter time. They all got attracted to our building. It had food and warmth. So at first you think, okay, no big deal, a few pests in there. But as the year went on, the pests got bigger and scarier <laughs> and meaner. I mean, we had slugs. That you've never seen before, like, and millions of them. We tried everything sluggo, we tried beer in these things, right? Supposed to, like, they're supposed to, like, lump the beer and drown in it. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if you know anything about slugs. Do you know about slugs? They're nasty. They're nasty because guess what? They have male and female parts in each slug they self-reproduce. Is that disgusting? <laughs> they don't even need each other to reproduce. They're just like reproducing and growing in our greenhouse. Okay, but then as the year, as the spring went on, we started getting these, I guess they're hornworms. These big green oh, worms with their horn coats. I mean, things we never we haven't seen since. Okay, so there was this pest just kept, and then mice and stuff got in there. Just kept going. And so then we also thought that a heat, you know, it's winter time. We need a sealed, heated building for the produce to grow. But when you have a sealed, heated building, you don't have airflow. And a greenhouse needs airflow. And so we also then had an issue with mold developing. So it did not work. So we then, that's what those bees are after. What is that? That's, that's a yellow jacket. It's not a bee. You might have just set it on the ground and maybe. No, I don't know. Okay. So then we managed to find our way to a farming conference that winter that we were fighting with the heated greenhouse. And we put row cover in the greenhouse. You'll see pictures if you come to my presentation. You'll see pictures of this during one of my presentations. I think it's the Saturday talk. Yeah, Saturday. And a little bit on Sunday, because Sunday I'm talking about growing early or moon tomatoes, which is the same as these. So anyway, we had row cover in this heated greenhouse, whatever, um, a mess. So we went to a farming conference, and we learned about a gentleman. You may know him. Elliot Coleman. He grew in an unheated high tunnel, winter greens, all winter long. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. Winter greens in an unheated high tunnel in Maine. Because everyone around here said, you cannot do it, Janet. You're in the mountains. And I'm like, this guy's doing it in Maine, where they actually get colder weather than we do here. What was it in? So this guy wrote a book. And, you know, anyone can write a book, is which I have two books coming out. <laughs> okay. Anyone can write a book, but it doesn't mean it's going to really work. And even Kevin was skeptical. And me too. And I'm like, well, let's give it a try. So you're going to see the first little hike tunnel, which is one right behind the farmhouse. Yeah, oh, low battery. Low battery. Okay, that's all right. I'll plug it in after we're done. I we're winging it in here today. Bad, so. Okay. Not so, we got material at Home Depot, like um, a conduit for electrical things. And we, we had a bender and we bent and we built our own little handmade high tunnel. The first one you're going to see at the tour. And actually, we were late. It was already, the tomatoes were already done. And we just went ahead and planted some spinach and mizuna, which was like a mustard green. We didn't know what was going to happen. And still very skeptical. Well, it grew. And it was amazing. And as a matter of fact, it is the most delicious spinach you will ever eat. It's spinach grown in the middle of the winter in an unheated high tunnel. So what we do, we just literally plant it in rows. You'll see pictures of my presentation on PowerPoint this weekend. And it grew. And here's what's interesting. We... We would, when it gets really cold, we would put row cover over the spinach in the high tunnel. So each layer of covering takes you a zone south. Okay, so first of all, then we're going two zones south, but that still doesn't take you all the way through the winter. What's amazing about winter greens is you literally they can let them freeze in the ground. And if they're still in the ground, when the, it's daylight the next day, they will fall off and be fresh, and you can keep harvesting and they'll keep growing. Isn't that amazing? So 
the greens in the ground can actually freeze, and you can let them thaw and keep it. We harvested and ate and delivered to, lo to Seven Springs, the local restaurants, spinach all winter long. That was so successful that we went ahead and got the NRCS grant. Are you familiar that the government gives grants for high tunnels because they want people to do more growing? And we then built the larger high tunnel, which you're going to see way in the back. As a matter of fact, last year, Mother Earth came to a field day here, and we moved the high tunnel. This is a movable high tunnel. It is the only movable high tunnel in the region. And what is a movable high tunnel, and why would you want to move a high tunnel? This we also learned from Elliot Coleman. So, right now in that high tunnel you're going to see, and do ignore all the weeds and the mess because we're very understaffed this year, and also Kevin has been very ill. He had an accident last year, he's been ill, so we're just, we're struggling. But we're, that's why Shana joined us and a few other people have joined us. We're going to get stronger and better here. But you will see tomatoes and peppers in the high tunnels. Tomatoes and peppers love the heat, right? And they love the, the, the hottest months of the year. So they're in there are heat-loving plants in the hot high tunnel during the hot months. But what we've done is we've prepared a field to the right of the movable high tunnel where we're getting ready to plant spinach. And the spinach will start to germinate here. We're going to plant it next week. We're a little bit late. We really like to plant it by the end of August. But we plant it as late, later than this before, and it works. Okay, Spinach, and we're going to do kale. And we're going to do beets and carrots in this field that's outside. As the tomatoes and peppers die off, they're done. We then take tractors and move the movable high tunnel over the spinach before frost. Then the spinach grows in there all winter. Next summer, when the spinach is done, we plant our tomatoes and peppers in there. Next, end of next summer, early fall, we prepare this field for winter greens, and then we only have to move the high tunnel once a year, and we pull across. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you could find it, a year ago, Mother Earth News, we have a, a, a video, it's not a live video, but we have a video of our high tunnel being moved with Mother Earth News here. They had a tractor company and our tractor, and we, so it's pretty cool. Very slow. It's like they go real slow. But you'll see the high tunnel... The way this the one is built, it's actually sort of like on a sort of like a sled. It's on like rails that bend up at the end. And there are anchors in the ground, and you'll see ratchet straps in the high tunnel where we ratchet the high tunnel down to the anchors in the ground. Because remember we get wind here, <laughs> okay? As a matter of fact, the day we tried to put plastic on the high tunnel, the wind decided to pick up and we couldn't get it on. We had to wait till a calm day. So that's ratchet. So to move it, we undo the ratchet straps, take two tractors, pull it across over the next field, and there are anchors in the ground there, and we ratchet it there. Okay? So that's how we're growing winter greens without heat. There's like no effort. When we have irrigation system, okay, it's like no effort. We're not trying to heat something. There's no expense of heating. Okay, because you have to realize you can only still only sell spinach for so much, even if it's in the middle of the winter. You know, you can't pay the heating bills if you're trying to heat something. So, no heat, very little effort, amazing, and the most delicious greens you will ever taste. Okay, so we're doing that. Now, how are we also extending the season with some of our other produce, like tomatoes? And I'm going to teach you on Sunday at the Mother Earth News Fair how to do early heirloom tomatoes. In this part of the country, tomatoes from all the local farms are harvested in August, maybe late July if you're lucky, right? Anybody here grow tomatoes? Yeah. And are you used to that? You gotta wait till the end of the summer. Well here at Sana View Farms, we love eating stuff from the farm and we do all year and I'm actually teaching that. That's Saturday's talk, how to enjoy food from your garden all year. I'm teaching about all that. And we start to crave tomato sandwiches when we're ordering our tomato seeds in like December and June. We cannot wait to have a tomato sandwich. So we're like, okay, we have these high tunnels. Let's give this a try. So what we do now is we actually start our tomato and pepper seedlings and some cucumbers too and a few other things. End of January, early February. When do you normally set your, start your tomato seedlings? 
April-ish. It's like six to eight weeks before the end of frost, right? Look at me. I'm like two months ahead. And you'd be thinking, well, how is that possible? So we start seedlings in trays under grow lights. First year, we actually did it in the farmhouse, but now we have people running the farmhouse to help produce income to pay for the farm, that we actually have a heated garage. It has a little electric heater on the wall. Okay, so it's one little garage that we are turning the heat on. So we have seedlings under grow lights, and the grow lights provide some heat too, that we start end of January, early February. And these are heirloom seeds, organic heirlooms. Okay. Then when they get big enough and they're ready to transplant, we transplant them into four inch pots under grow lights in the garage. Then when they get ready to transplant again, when normally you would put them in the ground, we don't put them in the ground, we put them in pots. In big um, growing, like those black growing pots that you can just buy real cheap, yeah, the grow supply, mm -hmm. yeah. it has a hole in the bottom. We actually get dirt from the farm, and then we add in there some amendments, which I'm going to teach on Sunday at my talk on how to grow heirloom tomatoes, especially early heirloom. Mm -hmm. But we actually bring the dirt inside into the basement of the farmhouse. We fill the pots, bring it inside, and it gets to be the right temperature. Mm -hmm. Because what you need for seedlings, mm -hmm. the soil needs to be the right temperature. It's actually not even the air so much as the soil. And that's why you can't plant outside in the ground too early. And then also, of course, the frost, the risk of frost, which will destroy the plant. So we have pots of soil in the farmhouse, and then we transplant our tomatoes. You see the entire basement of the farmhouse, we have all these, and we have grow lights, okay, all over. And it's kind of interesting, and I'll teach you this on Sunday. There's a study that was done that you need seedlings you know, at like 70 some degrees, 70, actually 70 to 90 degrees for seedlings to germinate and to start. But actually, once they're so big, they can be moved to 50 to 60 degrees. And studies have shown you'll actually get more production from your tomato plants. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So once we move them into these big pots, they go into the basement of the farmhouse and actually fill the cooler down there. Mm -hmm. And we still grow lights, and they grow. Now, once we get to about late March, early April, when you're just starting your seedlings, we're taking our pots of tomatoes and putting them in the high tunnel. And in the high tunnel, the dirt is already also warming, but we have pots of tomatoes mm -hmm. in there. And we leave them in the pots because we don't want to transplant them now again. And we have pots of tomatoes growing, and we have been known to harvest the most beautiful heirloom tomatoes by the end of June. And they stay in the pot. Out of pots. They're in pots. Okay. The only issue we have with them, we do a whole second planting where we put in the ground. Uh -huh. Actually, you're going to see all of them in the ground because they were the yeah, second planting. The same, okay. The same in the high tunnels now. You're doing the second planting. So you have a, 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 a one harvest in the pot, and then you do for you two or three months. And then you and we already have a second set wow. starting in the ground, and then we're harvesting. Wow. I mean. I should keep track easily four months worth of harvesting tomatoes, right? Because also in the high town, remember when it's getting colder outside, right. you start to lose light, right, and so forth. But it gets colder outside, it's not colder in the high tunnel yet. It's not like bitter cold yet outside. Mm -hmm. So we get a little bit longer. We didn't, again, we were short-staffed this year. We didn't take care of the tomato plants as well as we normally do, so they'll probably give up on us a little bit earlier this year because they needed more care. Mm -hmm. But um, we, it's just amazing. It's amazing. And let me tell you something, you guys aren't commercial growers, but there is something, oh, one guy is, there is something about, can you imagine what you can charge for a local heirloom, organic heirloom tomato in June? In August, everybody's got tomatoes, and the price comes down. So, we're extending that, and it's tremendous. Now, we also noticed this year, and we're just like, we're just trying stuff. We're just like, well, let's try this and see what happens. This spring, way, I mean, it was late winter, we put beets we in this greenhouse and Swiss chard. It's not that Swiss chard's all bug bitten, but we just keep harvesting. I keep eating it. It just keeps. We were, I was eating Swiss chard late winter, early spring, out of this greenhouse, no heat. And the beets, we had beets come up.